When most people think of a bee, they're probably picturing this bee, the Western honeybee. So this is a European species which now present on every continent except for Antarctica. Um, and there are feral colonies out there, but it is by and large a domesticated species that is managed by people to produce honey and to perform crop pollination. Many of you have probably heard that bee populations are in decline. Maybe even that saving the bee is a critical issue for the 21st century. I am going to be talking about pollinator conservation today, but I want to be really clear that the honeybee is not currently at any risk of extinction. There are actually more honeybee colonies today than there have ever been before. If that's the case, then why am I still talking? <laughs> what bees could be implicated in pollinator conservation? Well, there are actually over 20,000 species of wild bees worldwide. And these bees come in all shapes and sizes. As you can see, they're really beautiful and they vary widely in their um, physical appearance as well as their behavior and ecology. Most of them really bear very little resemblance to a honeybee. So uh, over 90% of wild bees are actually solitary, which means that instead of living in a big hive with a queen and tens of thousands of workers, each female creates her own nest where she lays her eggs. And she provisions those, uh, that, ne that nest and those eggs with nectar and pollen that she collects from um, flowers all by herself. We do have a few social wild species. Um, those include some bees in the um, group of bumblebees, as well as sweat bees. But they typically live in much smaller colonies of between 50 and 100 workers. There are even parasitic bees, if you can believe it. These are bee species that lay their eggs in the nest of another bee species so that their young can devour um, not only the larva collected by another bee so pretty smart. They don't have to do any of the work themselves. The majority of wild bees actually live underground. Um, they build their homes by burrowing into the dirt or by colonizing holes that are made by other animals like rodents. Some of them also um, live in cavities in wood or even excavate the soft parts of plant stems and build their nests inside. Bees also like to line their, um, their nest cells with a variety of materials that can include um, leaves and flower petals, mud, resin, and pebbles, or even the hairs that they scrape from the stems and leaves of plants. So why should we care about these wild bees other than the fact that they're just kind of cool? Well, wild bees provide really critical pollination services to both crops and wild plant species. Although none of these are, um, they're not managed on the same scale as a honeybee, a lot of wild bee species actually provide higher quality pollination services to, um, to crops to provide um, higher quality fruits that a honeybee would. So for example, the bumblebee is the most effector, effective pollinator of tomatoes and blueberries because those um, species don't release their pollen unless the anther is vibrated at a specific frequency that the honeybee can't contain, the bumblebee. Wild bees also provide this, this form of biological insurance policy because they can fill in the gaps in pollination services when um, the honeybee stocks are insufficient to pay agricultural demand. In a natural ecosystem, wild bees are even more critical. 90% about of flowering plant species um, are fertilized by animals, and primarily by wild bees. That allows these plants to reproduce and of course, those plants form the basis of terrestrial food webs, right? They're um, providing shelter and food to herbivorous animals that are in turn consumed by higher order predators. Unlike the honeybee, these species are not domesticated and their um, continued existence is just, it's not guaranteed. Human beings have replaced a lot of the Earth's natural ecosystems with these highly modified land cover types. And in some cases, um, it may not be surprising that can present some issues for our native pollinators. So for example, we know that industrial agricultural practices like the use of um, pesticides, tilling, and monocultural cropping can exclude wild bees from a lot of agricultural landscapes or affect their health. But in contrast, we know almost nothing about the um, impacts of management activities in other areas, especially in forests. 
Forests compose about 30% of the um, local land cover. And conifer forests, intensively managed for wood production, um, take up over 48 million hectares um, just in the western United States. However, we know almost nothing currently about the value of these areas of habitat for wild bees. So what do I mean when I say intensively managed? Intensive forest management really refers to a suite of practices that are used um, to maximize timber production. So those include clear-cut harvesting, removal of slash and other woody debris after harvest to um, increase availability of light and soil nutrients for crop trees, planting um, nursery-grown seedlings at high densities, and the use of herbicides to suppress competing vegetation. And all of these things have effects on our intensively managed forest landscapes. The most obvious effect that you can see is that they make trees grow really fast, right? So, um, a typical timber rotation, that is the time that it takes for trees to grow before they can be harvested and replanted, is only about 40 years in the Orange and Blue Strain, which is pretty darn short. And actually these two sites here that you see are only about 10 years apart in age, it's hard to believe. On a broader scale, these um, practices also create this interesting structure that sort of looks like a patchwork blanket. Um, so you can see there's these distinct edges between the harvest units or stands at different ages and a high um, structural uniformity within stands. Like here you can see that all of the trees in the stand are about the same size because they were planted at the same time, so the same age. And there's not a lot of gaps between them because of that high seedling density that was used. So we wanted to know what are the effects of these forest management practices on wild bees. Our first question was, what bees occur in forests because we really have no idea. It's pretty basic. And then what happens to these communities as forests are harvested and then continue to grow and regenerate? The first study I'm going to talk to you about was um, conducted by Dr. James Rivers and Matthew Betts in the McDonald and Dunn Research Forests, which are owned by Oregon State University and managed for research, education, and recreation right here in Corvallis. And conveniently for our research, they were located right, um, they're located right on the edge of the Oregon Coast Range, which is a globally important region for timber production. So Jim and Matt, they selected 14 um, stands that were aged between one and 15 years after clear cut harvest. And they surveyed flowering plants and sampled bees using traps during the summer of 2014. And in total, they observed over 2,000 bees representing 67 species and 20 genera. And what they observed was that the abundance and the richness, that is the number of species present, peaked about three years after the stand was harvested, and then declined as the forest continued to regenerate. And the density of the flowering plants, which is the food that bees rely on, followed a similar pattern. In the first study that I joined in the lab, we expanded the sampling effort to a broader area geographically and over a larger timeline. We sampled 60 stands aged um, one to 35 years post-harvest all across the central part of the Oregon Coast Range. And we um, used a couple different methods to sample our bees as well as measuring floral resources and structural characteristics of the stands for two years. And what we found with our expanded sampling efforts was over 12,000 individual bees representing 148 species. So that is about 20% of the total number of bee species that are known to occur in the entire state of Oregon. And if you consider that, like historically, forests have not even been considered as viable bee habitat, this is a pretty exciting result for us. The majority of the bees that we observed, or the majority of bee species that we observed, were solitary ground nesters with um, fairly generalist feeding habits. But some of the um, most common species that we saw, including bees in the bumblebee and sweat bee genera, were social, which, as you remember what we discussed earlier, that means that the queen has daughter workers to help her raise her young. We also observed a lot of bees in this genus Melisodes, um, which is a bee species that is solitary and forages late in the season. We also saw quite a lot of um, a diversity of floral resources, 
flowering plant communities in these areas, including both native and exotic species. And perhaps not surprisingly, we did see that there was a link between the number of bees and the abundance of food resources. Specifically, when the number of flowers doubled, we saw a corresponding 20% increase on average in the number of bees. Similar to the earlier research done in the McDonald's and Dunn research forests, we saw that the abundance and species richness of bees um, started off pretty high after harvest and then declined quite rapidly afterwards. And with our larger um, range of stand ages, we could see that there is kind of a threshold after which very few bees occurred. And that seemed to occur right around the average age of canopy closure, about 11 years post-harvest in our stands. You can really see that threshold effect in this heat map of the 60 most common species. Like after that 11 year mark, things just kind of fell right off, right? So what that tells us is that canopy closure is probably a really important factor um, that contributes to the quality of the habitat in forests. And that makes sense because the amount of canopy cover determines the amount of light that reaches the forest floor. And that regulates the blooming of flowers that bees forage on, as well as the microclimate and the understory. Fuller, darker microclimate might be less conducive to bee foraging because they require warm ambient air temperatures to form up those flight muscles. And they also um, navigate using patterns of polarized light. In the landscapes we studied, this window of habitat suitability was really short, right? Only 11 years post harvest. And that is probably in part due to the productivity of the region, but mostly due to those intensely forest management practices, as I mentioned before, which really accelerate the, tree, the, the rate of tree regeneration. So what are we gonna do with this information now that we have it, right? Do we like chop down all of the forests to make bee habitat? Probably not. <laughs> um, there are a lot of, of values to forests, obviously. They, um, provide a lot of amazing ecosystem functions, and old growth forests in particular are critical to a number of endangered species that have lost a huge amount of habitat in recent centuries, so we don't want to lose any more. But it is also worth noticing that young forests are now among the scarcest in North America. And these areas are beneficial not only to native bees, but also to other disturbance-dependent biota. That includes butterflies and beetles, as well as a lot of songbirds, woodpeckers, raptors, um, herbivorous mammals like elk and deer, and omnivorous megafauna like bears. Now historically, these areas were um, maintained by periodic natural disturbances like wildfires, windstorms, insect infestations, as well as cultural burning by indigenous peoples. But these patterns of disturbance have been suppressed or um, just dramatically altered under our modern land management regimes. For decades, the dominant paradigm in forest management after a major disturbance has been recovery. And that means recovery to the pre-disturbance condition of a closed canopy forest. That's true both for private land and managers that want to maximize timber production, as well as um, public landowners and policymakers that are prioritizing multiple uses like biodiversity. Learning to value these areas might lead us down a little bit of a different path, where we're seeing these kind of open, kind of treeless phases of forest development, not just as a precursor to a mature forest, but as being important in their own right. And that could also mean that biological conservation initiatives and policy incentives um, shift from prioritizing immediate reforestation to allowing a slower and lower intervention generation process. In a commercial forestry context, of course, there are some trade-offs to consider, right? Increasing the longevity of this pre-canopy closure period probably means waiting longer to harvest trees and sell them more timber. But um, something that is worth considering is that those intensive forest management practices aren't cheap either. So a recent study that was done by another group at Oregon State University showed that even moderate reductions in herbicide use can have big benefits for wild bees and some of these other disturbance-dependent biota. And it might be the financially smarter option in some cases as well. Even within our current intensive forest management paradigm, we can see from our research that bees can and do use those ephemeral forest types. 
So forest managers might be able to boost the biodiversity in those areas further by promoting um, high quality forage for wild bees and young stands, or maybe along roadsides where they're already doing the revegetation for erosion control. Obviously, the ecology of bees and forests is still really very little known in this area of study, as you can see, there's a lot left to learn. But what we can tell now is that these areas can support bee biodiversity. And so the takeaway really from this research is just that bees exist in forests, um, that pollinator initiatives for conservation of pollinators should, should not just be focusing only on agroecosystems and other typical pollinator habitat scenarios, but also should include forests. And on the flip side of that, conservation initiatives that are targeted at forests should not just be focusing maybe on old growth, but shouldn't forget about some of those earlier phases of forest development as well. They hold a lot of biodiversity. So with that, I would like to thank all the landowners that gave us access to um, their land and their data, as well as our funders at the USDA and NSF and all the people that helped make this work possible, as well as you guys for listening. Thank you so much.